Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this Rick and Video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. You might recall yesterday I released a video which went through some rumours concerning the GTX 11 series. Specifically, there were two sets of rumours, one for the mobile side and one for desktop side. Well, we have an update to the mobile side of things, and this once again comes to us through the website Laptop Media. So... The allegations yesterday were that the 11 series, at least for mobile, would not be released until November, December time, in other words, the holiday season this year. And we saw the evidence of a laptop, the Lenovo Legion Y530, which would be sporting the GTX 1160. Now, of course, this does make some sense. After all, Lenovo themselves had leaked the existence that, yes, the GTX 11 series would be launched over the next couple of months, and they would indeed be incorporating the 1180s in their desktop lineup, which did make an awful lot of sense. However, laptop media have since slightly updated the information that's available. And here's what we've ascertained. Firstly, it will be using six gigabytes of memory for the 1160M. I want to stress that again, M. This is the mobile part. The second thing, at least according to this website, if you look at the URL, it's GDDR5, not GDDR5X or R6. So does this mean that we're still looking at a 192-bit memory bus? Well, of course, there are a couple of things that we need to take into consideration. The first is that this information just may be completely and utterly inaccurate to begin with. They could even have a typo in there. It could be that this information is subject to change, or it could just be, well, they're just wrong. The second thing we need to take into consideration is, and let's just for a second presume that the information is accurate. Well, we don't know the clock speed of the memory for a start. And the second thing is that we don't know what technologies the next generation of 11 series is going to bring to the table when it comes to compression and saving a bandwidth. For example, if you have, let's just use really simple numbers, 300 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth, but then you release a next generation chip which puts out the same level of performance as the previous generation chip, but only has 250 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth, obviously... There's a problem there, right? Uh, it's not going to have enough bandwidth to be able to put out that level of performance. But what if it was considerably more efficient? And that's one of the things that they did do with Pascal. There was a lot, there was better uh, color compression and other technologies, which did drastically reduce the amount of physical bandwidth that was required to pump around those frame rates. And that was tangible. You could see that quite clearly with benchmarks that the cards were not necessarily majorly bandwidth constrained. You could overclock the memory and it would not drastically improve performance like a one-to-one -one ratio, which you would expect if it was majorly bandwidth constrained in terms of RAM. However, right now there are a couple of questions that we need to ask. The first is what does this mean for the 11 series as a whole? I mean, some folks are really concerned right now that we're going to be seeing a Pascal refresh. Now, the reason I'm pretty confident that this is not going to happen, rather than like running around panicking, um, GDDR6 memory is pretty much confirmed for next generation GPUs at this point, which would evidently point to the fact that the next generation of GPUs is going to require a lot of additional memory bandwidth. It's also possible, at least in theory, that they could just opt to go with an even smaller memory bus and put in, let's say, 14 gigabytes per second memory. So that could be one way to go, but most, really li most likely, I'm pretty confident we're going to see a next generation of GPUs. There are also a couple of reports, although how much stock I put in them, I'm not sure, that tell us that the next generation of GeForces is going to be monstrous in terms of performance level. So I'm pretty darn confident that at least the 1180s and probably the 1170s are going to be considerably more powerful than the previous generation. So I wouldn't really worry about this leak too much. Even if it is genuine, it's possible that it's just an early mobile part. It's possible that that's all the performance we need. After all, we don't know what the 1160M actually is going to bring to the table. It's possible it's just a Pascal refresh for mobile, or it's possible that NVIDIA are going to slightly change the scheme of how they're going to put out mobile parts. For example, and this is a pure example, I'm not saying this is the case, but it's possible that they could have, let's say, the 1160, which would be put out roughly, 
say 30 or 40 percent higher performance than the current 1060 and then there could be the 1160 Ti M which could put out considerably more and in which case that would have GDDR6 memory and these are only examples this is not to say this is the case unfortunately no one really knows the exact specifications of this card yet my gut feeling though and I'm going to say this one more time I personally predict that we're going to see uh, Volta variant, uh, I think that's what Turing is, because we've kept on seeing this Turing thing. By the way, if this had happened uh, just for a uh, for, uh, demonstration, just for a second, or I guess a for exercise, if this had been news 12 months ago, or 8 months ago, or something like that, I might have been more willing to buy in from a Pascal refresh, because there were those rumours, I don't know, like 8 or 9 months ago, I can't remember exactly, that we would be seeing a Pascal refresh from NVIDIA, but they just never panned out. The rumours were back then that we would see a shrunk down, a die shrink, basically, of Pascal. It would sport higher clocks and all that stuff, but it just didn't, it just didn't come to fruition. So instead, I'm much more likely to jump on the, the, the Turing train, and I think the next generation is going to be basically a shrunk down, tweaked version of Volta, and by shrunk down I mean obviously fewer CUDA cores in let's say the 1180s or what have you, and that's pretty much what my guess is. So I'm just reporting this piece of news to just say don't panic, I don't think that this is like a refresh, but it is interesting, if it is accurate, that we're going to be seeing 6 gigabytes again. Unfortunately there is one piece of bad news to go with the graphics card um, roundup today, and that is that mining is going to make a comeback, at least in the short term. Of course, the fact that mining has become less profitable of late has been good news for, well, gamers. Unfortunately, there has been, of course, a flood in China, and this natural disaster has not only affected the people there, but also it's destroyed a large swathe of hardware which is used for mining. According to the Chinese language website Economic Daily News, uh, by the way, this is also posted on DigiTimes who are running with the story, about 70% of the mining systems are actually located in China. So since this flooding in Shui Hong, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly, tens of thousands of mining systems have been damaged. And that's actually dropped the total calculation for mining performance of the world, I just want to stress that, by around 30%, which is absolutely bonkers. So, of course, in the short term, they're going to be buying a lot of GPUs. So this may have one of two effects. The first effect is it might be good news. Why? It might slightly raise the prices in the short term, but... ASICs are still a thing, right? We all know that. We're all, we're all aboard the ASIC train. So what might happen is they just buy up a load of GeForce graphics cards in the short term, which might suck if you want to buy right now. But it might do is it might allow NVIDIA to shift this 300,000 or hundreds of thousands of GPUs it has spare, sell those to the miners who need them right now, and then we gamers can jump on daring, whatever, as soon as it's released. On the other hand, it might be bad news, because what it might do is also increase DRAM prices. We discussed yesterday how uh, Micron have been banned to be sold in China, and that we don't know how that's going to impact my um, uh, GPU prices. But furthermore, it might mean that the MSRP might be raised. After all, if we see GPUs go up, and I'm just going to throw a number at you, 20% again, so 20% over MSRP for, let's say, a couple of months, and NVIDIA don't release their graphics card for a couple of months, NVIDIA might say, hmm, well, you know, they're already at that price anyway, let's just release the next generation of GPUs at that price. And even if NVIDIA don't, there's a good chance that retailers might. So that's the bad news for today. Now I want to move over to AMD and yet more Ryzen processors. So we're gonna start out with the 2300 and the 2500X. Now these processors are actually looking to be a really good value for money. I'm gonna get into the benchmarks in just a second. So the 2300X and the 2500X may be fantastic value for folks who are just primarily gamers. So let's go through the specifications of these two CPUs. Now, they both have a base clock speed of 3.5 GHz and boost up to 4 GHz. Of course, they do not have any integrated uh, GPU, 
but the primary difference between them is SMT. So the 2300 does not have SMT, so it's just four cores, four threads, whereas the 2500X does have SMT, so we're looking at four cores, eight threads. Depending on the price difference and if we see uh, retail gouging, personally, I would advise you to go with the 2500X if your budget can accommodate it, because those extra threads I do feel may not be critical now if you're pushing your GPU to the absolute limits, but over the next couple of years, especially maybe even in the next six months or so, we don't know what's going to happen with game engines over the next several months, I would probably imagine that we'll find that those additional threads are kind of handy. So the website XFastest was also able to overclock both the 2300X and 2500X to 4.3 gigahertz. That's not shabby. You're looking at around a 300 megahertz increase in performance. I say around because obviously your sample might be totally different. So let's say for the sake of this, that you're getting around three to 400 megahertz, which is not too bad at all. If you're more willing to go with extreme measures of cooling, they also managed to run uh, these processes under liquid nitrogen, where they hit 5.65 gigahertz. So they were able to achieve 5,663 megahertz when running Cinebench, but they managed to hit 5.5 gigahertz where they received 895 points in multi-core and 233 in single core, whereas in CPU Z, they achieved 642 for single thread and 2,533 for multi. And if, you're cons and if you're curious about what the stock configuration, which I'm assuming a lot of you are not gonna be running on liquid nitrogen, that's just a theory of mine, they get 508.9 and 20,020 points with uh, multi-thread performance, which is pretty darn good. I actually really like the look of these processors and we're gonna to endeavor to review one as soon as possible. But my personal opinion is that if you are looking probably for a gaming orientated processor and you're on a budget, this is probably the processor for you. And they'll probably go wonderfully with something like a GTX 1060 or anything around that type of neighborhood. And now on to the iPhone 9. The analyst Arthur Leo of Phobon Securities is telling us that the iPhone 9 will retail at 799 US dollars. But you might say to yourself, oh, okay, that's fine. I mean, what margins of profit are Apple making, right? They could only be making like $2 profit per phone. That would be reasonable. No, 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 no. It's going to cost Apple $275. I'm just going to repeat that. It sells at $799 and will cost Apple just $275 to produce the phone. Now, there was a previous prediction from Mai Ching Huo who predicted that the phone would actually cost uh, 99 US dollars less than that to manufacture. But according once again to Lau, he predicts that we will see uh, the removal or the 3D touch and that will bring down the price of the phone's manufacturing cost by 10 US dollars. So removing the 3D touch feature from the phone will save Apple 10 US dollars per phone manufactured. And according once again to the analyst, we're going to be seeing a slightly higher cost on the 3D sensing module and also the screen, but the camera in the rear of the phone will actually be cheaper than that of the iPhone 8 Plus. Anyway, uh, now I think that just about wraps the video up. Hopefully that you have enjoyed it. There'll be an awful lot of content coming over the weekend. I'm really hard at work benchmarking. I've run countless benchmarks for a massive project that will soon be up on the channel and I'm really proud of it. So I think you guys are gonna really get a kick out of it. Uh, we have a couple of other reviews as well coming up and we have just received a, another product review sample from Adata. So we're gonna also be putting that up over the next couple of days as well. So thanks very much to them for sending over the product and more importantly, thanks very much to you for supporting us because honestly, well, yeah. As much as I'm doing the benchmarking, you guys are making this possible by supporting us, by watching us, by commenting, by subscribing, by liking, and just all around just being awesome. So thanks very much, and I mean that very deeply. With all of that said, take care of yourselves, and hopefully see you soon. Bye for now.